I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are... It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club. A podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome! If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to episode 114 of Dark and Stormy Book Club. We're very excited today for another In Agatha's Footsteps, and we have the queen of crime writers, Sarah Paretsky, and we are thrilled. Sarah Paretsky is the award-winning creator of the V.I. Warshawski detective novels. When Sarah introduced V.I. Indemnity Only in 1982, she revolutionized the mystery novel by creating a female investigator who uses her wits as well as her fists. Sarah challenged a genre in which women were traditionally either vamps or victims. In Deadland. V.I. Wachowski's latest adventure, and I believe this is number 20. Chicago may be the city of broad shoulders, but its political law is paid to play. Money changes hands in the middle of the night, and by morning, buildings and parks are replaced by billion-dollar projects. V.I. Wachowski gets pulled into one of these deals through her impetuous goddaughter, Bernie Fouchard. Bernie tries to rescue Lydia the Mirror, a famed singer-songwriter now living on the streets. Not only does Bernie plunge her and V.I. headlong into the path of ruthless developers, they lead to the murder of the young man Bernie is dating. We would like to welcome the very prolific and wonderful author of the V.I. Warshawski Mystery Series, Sarah Paretsky. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, good to be here. V.I. Warshawski has been a staple in our libraries for over 30 years. Will she ever slow down? You know, she is slower than she used to be. She worries about aging and not being able to keep up, but I don't see her going away. No, I hope she doesn't. I enjoy her books very much. How did V.I. come to be? Is she based on a real person? She's not based on any real person. What she's really based on is the wish that I had and many of my friends had when we were part of the generation that was first joining management and the professions in large numbers. We were facing a lot of pushback, and it was a confusing time, hard to know how to chart a course, how to act and react in the face of opposition to our presence in the workplace or in hospitals, law offices, where we were not clerks and secretaries, the girl. And VI came out of the sense that many of us had that we wanted to be able to push back, speak with a strong voice, and be taken seriously for what we were doing. She's a great role model. Deadland shares a spotlight on America's involvement with South American politics, as well as corruption in Chicago. Do you ever get any blowback from local powers that be because of this? Well, we'll see what the reaction is to Deadland. So far, I have to say that I do my thing, they do their thing, and nobody really seems to mind very much what I'm doing. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Maybe it means that I'm just so ineffectual that it doesn't matter what I say. I had the experience long, long ago. My third book, Killing Orders, was set against the backdrop of a real story of corruption in the Vatican Bank. Not just corruption, but probably some murders that were committed, at least with the knowledge of the Vatican Bank. There was a story on forged stock securities, which couldn't take place today because now they're all little bits and bites in the cyber sphere. But 
Back in those days, everybody had paper stock shares. The Vatican Bank had needed more cash reserves, and they went to some American mobsters to forge stock shares. Anyway, that was the crime that underlay the book. The Wall Street Journal had covered the story in great detail, and I was fascinated by it. So there used to be a priest in Chicago, Andrew Greeley. Talk about prolific writers. He wrote over 300 books. He was a sociologist. He wrote crime fiction. There was nothing that he didn't write. Father Greeley had a series with a priest as his detective. I think it was Father Blackie? Blakey? I can't remember the exact name. Anyway, when Killing Orders came out, Father Greeley also published one of the books in his series. And the newspaper that the Catholic Archdiocese sends out to all of the Catholics in Chicago, which is like three million, said that I was much kinder to the Catholic Church than Father Greeley was. So there you have it. (laughs) That's great. I had one favorite character in this book. I fell in love with Bear. Oh, good. He was a wonderful, wonderful character. Is there real Bear? Bear is an amalgam of a couple of dogs that I've met walking my dog along the lakefront. There are three or four men who are maybe in their 40s, 50s, who seem rather lonely to me. And they're not homeless. They're just lonely, constantly out walking their dogs. Well, what does that say about me? There I am, constantly out walking my dog. I'm lonely too. (laughs) But anyway, Bear looks very much like one of the dogs whose name is Hershey, who has that big square head and those mournful eyes. Coop was kind of based on the idea of these guys out with their dogs. But of course, Coop, Bear's owner, is a very different kettle of fish. He's a pretty troubled. Uh, Yeah, he's pretty troubled. (laughs) The dogs in the VI books are so much better behaved than any of my dogs ever were. Yesterday, I had to fight my dog, Kiara, for possession of a desiccated squirrel carcass. But she was still able to swallow the head before I got the body away from her. Ew. (laughs) Too much sharing. (laughs) In a recent interview, you said that some of the fans were disappointed when V.I. stopped drinking, well, or slowed down her drinking. How much do your fans dictate your characters? You know, that's a very specific example and one that I thought was both funny and rather telling. I used to drink a lot more than I'm able to today. I never was a very heavy drinker, but I used to have a wonderful collection of single malt whiskey. My husband and I might drink a bottle of wine at dinner or something like that. And I just can't handle alcohol anymore as I've gotten older. And VI's drinking, I had unconsciously cut way back on her drinking. And I got a letter from a man in England who was president of the Armagnac Society, Armagnac being a particular kind of brandy. And he said he was disappointed that VI had stopped drinking all those lovely Armagnacs that she used to drink. And I thought, oh my goodness, I've just unconsciously given her the same age-related weaknesses that I have. So I conscientiously try to up her alcohol intake. Unlike many of my brother and sister crime writers whose detectives are always battling alcoholism and fighting hard not to think about the next drink, I have to make V.I. want that next drink to keep her in character. Oh, dear, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? (laughs) No, it doesn't. Makes her sound human. And that's a big part of why we love her. We're always looking forward to the next V.I. adventure. Almost 30 years ago, Kathleen Turner became V.I. Warshawski's face in the movies. Were you happy with that portrayal? I didn't like the movie. I was grateful to Kathleen for wanting to make the movie. It was made because she owed Disney a film, and that was what she chose. She was hoping to do a whole series. The movie, the script was really not good, and it bombed deservedly at the box office. But the movie did bring my work to the attention of readers who hadn't known anything about it before. So I am grateful to her for that interest. I think she couldn't make up her mind whether she really wanted to be a VI kind of detective or whether she wanted it to have a lot more sexual undertones and overtones. So there's an opening scene in a bar, which is really to my mind, ludicrous, where the bartender is keeping a pair of VI's spiky red high heels in a box for her. And they (laughs) they go through all that. And I thought, oh, please don't do this. There was a lot 
like that going on and then Disney wouldn't allow any women to work on the script. They were hoping to make an action film that would appeal to their target audience of teenage boys. So there were a lot of teenage boy bad jokes in it. Yeah, it wasn't a great movie, but there you have it. Unfortunately, Disney owns the worldwide rights. I spent a small fortune thinking I was getting the rights back, but it turns out that the only thing that Disney conceded to me was U.S. distribution, which is useless because all movies are made for global distribution. So there will never be another movie. Oh, that's a shame. I would love to see a redo. It's just not going to happen. Oh, dear. Sadly, in 2018, your husband passed away. You said he was a great help on your book, Critical Mass. What was his contribution? My husband was a physicist. He was in high energy physics. He came to the University of Chicago as a protege of Enrico Fermi. And so through him, I had met many of the people who played a role in the Manhattan Project. Fermi was dead long before I met my husband, who was 20 plus years older than I was. Of course, ever since I had started meeting a lot of the Manhattan Project players, I had wanted to write a book that was set in that milieu. I just couldn't come up with a storyline, and time passed. Many of the people got very old and lost a lot of their memories, and many of them died. So it was kind of late in the day that I finally came up with a storyline that became Critical Mass. My husband, of course, was a huge help in working out the physics that shows up in the book and trying to make it comprehensible to me so that I could make it comprehensible to a general reader, and hopefully we both succeeded in that. That was a great book. One of your great creations, along with others, was Sisters in Crime. What gave you guys the idea to begin a women's group dedicated to writing crime stories? Back when we started Sisters, which was in October of 1986, that was when I held the first meeting to see what kind of interest there was in organizing. Women were having a hard time getting their books noticed. Sue Grafton and I published our first books in the same year in 1982, and we both got a lot of very nice critical attention. And I think it's because we were doing something that was perceived as chiefly masculine. That is, we were writing noir fiction, we were writing hard-boiled detective fiction. And it wasn't until I started meeting a lot of other women writers at national conferences that I found out that it was very hard for women to get reviewed. One of the biggest handicaps to having a career as a writer is not getting reviewed. 35% of all book sales for most writers, unless they're big list leaders, go to libraries. If your book isn't reviewed, the library isn't going to buy it. They need jury reviews. So that was the first issue that really seemed crucial, that women could get a first book published, but no one knew about it. And so their careers would stall or come to an end if they're one book or sometimes two books. So I gathered together 26 women at the BoucherCon, the big annual mystery convention that takes place, just to see whether people wanted to organize or if they just wanted to want and everybody was very enthusiastic. The organization grew out of that. Well, the book review project was our first project because that was such a critical one. And with the help of Jim Huang from the Drood Review, we got a list of all of the crime novels published in 1987, the following year. And then our volunteers just tracked all the reviews of all these books. And what we found was that a book by a man was seven times more likely to be reviewed in a national publication than a book by a woman. So that was our big impetus to action. First, we wrote to the review outlets, pointing out the discrepancy. Many of them responded very positively and started paying more attention to books by women writers. But the big thing that we did was create a books in print. So all of our members would contribute their titles and their ISBN numbers and we would take them to libraries ourselves and to bookstores and pretty soon bookstores first they would have a shelf of mysteries by women and then suddenly there would be like a whole wall of books by sisters in crime and then suddenly there were a lot of women who had lost interest in crime fiction because They didn't read the kind of blood and gore and women getting beaten up and being vamps and victims that was the staple of crime fiction. 
so pretty soon we were actually contributing to a huge growth in sales for the whole mystery genre.